And welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a great lunch break and you're ready to learn. Today, our next presentation is um, Dr. Rashmi. Our next presenter is Dr. Rashmi Kumar, and she will be discussing the topic study strategies to ace your STEM um, classes. So, Dr. Kumar is an associate director and specialist in STEM learning at the Office of Learning Resources at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Kumar develops modes of active learning and technology-driven learning programs for Penn students in STEM fields. She is especially proud of her work with pre-med students, advising on study strategies for science courses, preparing for high-stake exams, and applying to med schools. She has been recognized as STEM educator by the, Na by the NASA Endeavor Project. Please welcome Dr. Kumar, and remember to ask any questions you may have um, using the Q&A feature so that she might answer them at the end of our presentation. So I will now turn our screens on. And can you hear us, Dr. Kumar? Uh, yeah. Perfect. Um, let me ask to start video. There. Hi, Dr. Kumar. Hi, Ali. How are you? Doing great. Very excited about your presentation. Oh, I am excited too. And thank you for your kind introduction. And it's good to see you after several months. Yes. Looking well. Thank you so much. So I'm actually really honored to have Dr. Kumar here with us today because she has been an exceptional mentor to me. I personally struggled um, making the transition from high school to college and my first semester was a little bit rough. But thanks to Dr. Kumar, um, I was able to overcome many challenges and I'm still here, still strong. Um, so now Dr. Kumar has prepared some questions and at this point I'm gonna go ahead and share them and we're gonna use the feature that we've been using. Um, and these are pretty short questions, um, but it's called a uh, pair deck. So let me start the lesson, give me one second. So I'm gonna go ahead and start. And after this um, brief questions, Dr. Kumar will start with her presentation, but we just wanna learn a little bit about you and um, kind of like your interests and why you're here today with us. So what's gonna happen now is you, once this loads, you're gonna see the website to go to and it's right here. So join pd.com and you're gonna insert this um, code so that you're able to answer the questions that we will bring up. So if everyone could do that, that would be great. We have a few students already. I'm gonna wait until it's closer to our number of participants. So I'll give everyone a few seconds. So Ali, uh, is the plan that I will answer and engage with these questions before the presentation or after the presentation? Oh, I was thinking before the presentation, correct? Or did you want to do them afterwards? Let's do them afterwards because many of these questions might also be answered within the uh, presentation. But I, if you have done it before, I am happy to start before also. So I'll leave it to you. I just wanted you to think about it. And I know it's right here. But if you think many students, looks like 18 students are connected into the platform. So why don't we start it? And that way it will give me a sense of what kind of topics to touch upon. Okay, perfect. So I'm gonna start it, but you, um, are still going to be able to see the code. So for all of our students who are still joining, the code is going to be up here on the top right. So just okay. go to the website and you can join there. Okay. So if you want, Dr. Kumar, you can ask the questions and comment on the responses. I'll just control the screen. Okay, good. Excellent. So yeah, this was our first question and I'm gonna start showing the responses. Okay. So 
so it has more content. And this question was basically the difference between studying for STEM and for humanity classes. Uh -huh. So these are the responses. Um, so STEM is more about memorizing concepts and humanity about writing and analyzing. Okay, good perspectives, all right. Mm -hmm. Critical thinking, practice problems. Requires time management, that's important. All right, um, would you like to move on to the next question, Dr. Kumar? Uh, no, let's uh, engage with this question briefly. I do enjoy the perspectives that students are sharing. Uh, one has to be careful in also not pigeonholing humanities versus STEM because STEM is not memorization. Actually, and I'll talk about it in the presentation, why STEM is less of memorization than we have been given to understand. And these are thoughts and takeaways that we develop from early childhood in school. But STEM requires much more critical thinking in many ways and asks you to interleave that thinking. So let's look at the next question. Perfect. I'm so, very excited about this one. Perfect. So the question is, what are your biggest success factors? Right. Um, I'm going to start seeing the students' responses. Interesting. I'm gonna give students a few more seconds so that they finish typing their answers. Sure. Office hours, preparing in advance, practice problems, asking questions, dedication, good support system, organization, I think these are all pretty good responses. Support system. Good, and I see many commonalities. So it gives me a sense of this is the takeaway of many people and having commonalities in the responses is a good thing because then we are touching upon the perspectives of several people. Okay, let's look at the third question. Perfect. So for everyone answering the, this question is, what are, the mo what are your most pressing cha challenges? And we're starting to get some responses. Mm -hmm. Tension, time management, and motivation, self-doubt. Yep, these are all very important concerns that I have had personally. Yeah, and it's, you know, something that's very common. The good news out of all this is that these concerns can be managed at, with a little bit of care, a bit of hand holding, and you can find that these concerns are recurringly present but they are not prohibitive to your success. See, there will be concerns, but if they don't prohibit you from achieving what you want, then in many ways, they are good catalysts for you to start building. And so we cannot just let it go because we have these concerns. We have to constantly think about how we can surpass these concerns and rise above them. Okay, great responses. All right, now I'm gonna stop sharing and you're free to share your screen, Dr. Kumar. Okay, all right then, that's what I'm going to do. 
Um, I want to say that I'm very excited to be here and I hope that this presentation allows you to develop some takeaways and of course you can leave some questions in the chat session and we will constantly keep engaging, okay? So with that, Okay, you can see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Excellent. Okay, so as Ali has said that I wo love working with pre-med students. Each year, my big pride of point is when many students will come and tell me they got accepted into med school or three med schools and four, and the biggest choice they are facing right now is how to pick and choose. However, one also has to be careful in developing that goal with study strategies. If you decide and if you embrace study strategies that will make you more efficient, then you can reach your goals and you can capitalize on your past performance, you can capitalize on your success factors and your networks, and you can also mitigate the concerns. Um, sorry, Dr. Kumar, we have one question now from the audience. They raised okay. your hand. Are, would you like to answer now or wait until the end? Let's wait a little bit, if that's okay with you, Ali. Perfect. Okay. These are the four kinds of trade-offs that I typically see in STEM subjects. Do I memorize or do I comprehend? How many sources of information should I be looking at? And how many sources of information are asked of you, given to you that you have to work with? And that's, that's big, that's really, an important concept of thinking about, do I use the textbook? Do I use the notes? Do I use my notes, my friend's notes? What do I use? The content moves much faster than you have been accustomed to in high school, which is true. It'll move even faster when you are in med school or dental school or high impact nursing degree. And then just before the exam, am I just flipping through pages or am I deep diving? So let's break down each of them and think about how we can make use of all these things. The next one is, is multitasking a real thing? I find, and my experience again and again will show, multitasking is more of a myth. Unless you are boiling potatoes on the side when you're doing some problem set, you cannot have a streaming video, Netflix or YouTube, or think that you can have two files open and that you can pay attention to them. Really multitasking, Think about your brain, how it functions. It can cognitively devote some information to some things. However, when you want to understand something or memorize something and look at how the piece of information that's in front of you is connected to the piece of information that was in front of you yesterday, and might be in front of you tomorrow. You cannot have two digital screens working. I've heard of people who have instrumental music playing as a white noise in the background. I've seen more success there, but I have not seen any student tell me they were watching or playing a video game while they were solving their chemistry problems or going through biological processes. So it's something of a myth 
that we have developed where we think I'm a multitasker. Um, no, not really. Most of us, and I, by most, I mean 98% people cannot cognitively pay attention to two things at a time. You can do something physical, as I said, if you want to throw in a load of laundry while you're working on problem sets, that's different. You know what to do. It's a routine. But to bring on something that is different and takes you into a mode of trying to understand, especially with multiple sources of information, multitasking is a myth. And when you feel that you were trying to multitask and you were not successful, forgive yourself. Be flexible with that takeaway because multitasking is really not a thing. So now let's unpack what it takes to be successful in STEM fields. What I have seen, what I have seen many times and what I continually advise my students. And we see great outcomes of that. So I'll make it simpler. Information cognitively flows three ways. The first one is the what, which is declarative, simple. Second one is the how, the procedures. And the third one is why, which is the pivot of all information. The what part is something that you have been accustomed to since you were in first grade. It includes what? Lists, categories, definitions. You might even pull out some PowerPoint slides your professors have shared with you. And you will see the first few slides are often engaged in the what component. Just because it's at the bottom of the pole or the ladder, it does not mean that it is not important. The what part is very important. However, to answer something that is prefaced in how and why, you need to know the what. So the what is where we memorize things, but we cannot leave it at that. You may have left it at that when you were in middle school, maybe early high school, but in college, and especially if your goal is to prepare for MCAT or that, you cannot let what rule your life. And I'll tell you why you don't want the what component to rule your life. So this is Bloom's taxonomy. You may have heard of it since you were in middle school or elementary school. I added a next thing to it. So the, if you look at the cursor, the first two, the remember and understand, they usually comprise the what part. Then we move on to the application and analysis. And that is where the how is coming into play. And the third one is the create and evaluate. That is why the why is coming into it. Now, if you look at the third section, how is the what changing into when we move into application and analysis? What's happening? Since we are not in person and I cannot see your responses, I'm sure you have many responses. The what has moved into a what if. So what happens here? The what, the simple piece of straight away information has now become hypothetical. It has become contextualized and it is asking you to look at more than one variable at a time. It, you could see a question in the form of, in the case of what happens, compare X and Y, those are very commonly seen, examine A versus B versus C. Again, you are now taking the simple 
silos of information that were in the category of what, and now compiling them, putting them into juxtaposition with each other and answering a question. The why part is very interesting because it's looking for you to tell us why you think this should be done in this way. In a very simple scenario, when you were in high school, many of the questions were asked at the bottom too, remembering and understanding. And you could be really good at your subject. But when you start moving into the upper level classes from sophomore year, second semester onwards, you will find the what questions start decreasing to a point where many times they are no more than 30% of your exam. And the how and the why part of the question starts increasing where how and why take up somewhere between 60, 70%. Now try to see what has happened. If you depend just on the what component, you are prepared well, you have all the information, but you are prepared for 30, 40% of the question. Think about what your grades will look like. Many times students come to me and say, you know, I worked very hard and I absolutely know that they must have worked hard. However, the questions did not look like anything I had prepared. Yes, that is also true. So that conundrum, I had worked hard, I had prepared hard, I had really gone through everything multiple times. However, the questions did not talk to me. That is the reason, because we are prepared for the what level of questions whereas the professor wants you to answer the what if type of question. Think about it and we can talk more at, towards the end because this is very critical. I think uh, most of my students will tell you that there is an epiphanous understanding when they make that switch from not relying just on what, which, when questions, how, but moving towards what if in the case of what happens, and you can extrapolate and add more questions that will talk about how things are being treated in the whole context. Think of a patient, patient A could have, um, let's say, a cardiac ailment and patient B could have a cardiac ailment. However, unless we know what the other medical history of the patient tells us, we cannot totally treat that patient. So knowing information is important. Knowing it in the context of the whole picture is important you might be thinking, how do I study the whole picture? We're going to look into that. So you will see that I'm going to move my screen so I can look at. This is the big beast. If you want to start acing your STEM classes, you really want to look at the how part and ask yourself to be prepared for the how part. And the more you focus on the how part, the what part is not unnecessary, it is critical. However, if you are preparing for an exam or you are looking to really understand the content, in any subject, whether it's bio, biochemistry, chemistry, organic chemistry, physics, math, you really have to pay attention to the middle ground where you're comparing variables. Okay, so 
there's content distributed across many, many pieces of information. The simplest one is you have text, you have graphics, and you have images. Now what happens is we think we have so much more to study with. And many times you do, you have the recitation lectures, you have the TA's notes, the professor's notes, your own notes, a friend's notes. So things start adding. Now you start looking at other little, little things that you need to do. Third comes your own deadlines and tasks. Now it looks like a big menagerie. I would say go back to the simplest things Keep it simple, read through the syllabus. You'll be surprised how many students will come to me and when I ask them, so what does the professor write in the syllabus? And you know it, and I know it, that students look to the syllabus to see when their midterms are and their finals are. Look at the first page of the syllabus to identify what the professor really wants you to know. So Professor A might be teaching cell bio and Professor B might be teaching cell bio, but the takeaways they plan for you to take out of that course are different. So do read the syllabus and then we'll build upon it. Now add more things into it. Mapping information, I'm going to give you some digital tools that are my favorite tools and I've seen great success with them. So it could be drawing a picture diagram of the entire chapter, entire section. Why would you do that? Because you learn the associative value of one piece of the chapter to another piece of the chapter. The more you learn information, not as siloed pieces of information, but as connected, associated, dependent pieces of information, the better prepared you are to answer the what if question. Summarize things, not in the professor's words, not in the book's language. Think of if you were talking to a younger sibling, how would you tell them what you just studied? Can you call a parent, tell them what you did? And do analyze definitions because most definitions have very good clues that tell you how to keep raising your skill. Break down chapters and sections. This is my simplest graph, something I find very helpful and my students tell me again and again too, that it's very helpful. Look at the chapter. What are the critical ideas of the chapter? What is the key vocabulary that defines that chapter? There, in a whole chapter, there are six to eight pieces of key vocabulary that will define it. Now break it down section by section. What's the critical idea of section one? What's the key vocabulary? Similarly, do section two and section three. When you have a graph like this, talk to it. Talk into static pieces of information is very helpful. We call it multimodal learning in cognitive sciences. And the reason is that when you talk to something and no one else is hearing you except the paper, the mirror, or your table, your voice reigns supreme in your thinking process. We preempt our own voices, our own enunciation more than anything else. We need to capitalize on our enunciation of talking, information, juxtapositioning information, making information work for us. So spend five minutes, put down this kind of a graphic. It would take you about half an hour and then spend another half an hour talking to it. Then put it away and for five minutes, try to think of 
what were the key things that you took away? You will know more and you will remember more with greater clarity. Another way of doing it, this is created in OneNote or maybe it was in Evernote. So you can decide how you want to break down. Some of us like pen and paper, some of us like digital. There is no research that tells us whether writing things in by hand or typing on the computer is faster or more effective. People of my age didn't grow up with computer. So sometimes we latch on to things of the past and say, writing is more helpful. The reason writing can be more helpful that it takes more time. So you are thinking about that word or line for a few more seconds, but in essence, the takeaway is less divided. There's very little discrepancy in writing something or creating something digital. So let go of what you may have heard that writing is better. You have to look at your own learning styles and think about what appeals to me. So these are the key underpinnings of being successful. The big picture understanding, retention of material, retrieval of the studied material, for example, and self-regulating time and emotions during exam. And we'll talk about that now. The last one is, are you reading the questions purposefully or are you giving the questions everything you know about the question? If you are just giving the question something that you know about it, you might be right about something, but you're not right about the question that is being asked. Another way to break down information is to categorize it. It's a cognitively established fact that when we break down information into categories, we remember more. We understand the associative value of things. So you could take the same thing, write down the concept, write down the key terms or the variables and the relationship. This is more for biological sciences. If it was for physical sciences, you would put in the numeric value of the symbols and the formulae in column three and column four. Always ask yourself, why? Why is this important? Why am I putting it down? Because when you keep pushing back at the information, don't just take information for granted. Don't believe everything that's in the textbook or in the professor's PowerPoint. Push back at it and ask why. When you ask why, you will know more. Ask why again, you will know even more. So let's take it to a real context. If you are studying, let's say diseases and causes and you break it down into first column body part, then symptoms, then intervention. When you inf break down information like this, uh, you are now building a narrative in your thought process. It is going from one element to second element to the third element. And as you start building a narrative, you will be able to eliminate the wrong choices in multiple choice exam with greater ease. Many of you might recall that when you're looking at a multiple choice exam, you're able to eliminate three or four, you're left with two. And now you're struggling which one of the two are you picking? You can't go with rock, paper, scissor shoe and you can't say, okay, I'll just pick this. That is not a good strategy. You need to know which one to pick. And there's a science of multiple choice exams. And when you know things like a storyline and a narrative, you have greater success in picking the right choice. 
Don't stop asking the why. Now you want to confirm that you know what you think you know, because many of us think, oh, you know, I spent the whole week preparing for Orgo 2 exam. I should be ready. You probably are. But if you're not, then how do you know that you know what you think you know? Write down questions that you have generated by asking the question, why? When you write down question with greater clarity, you will also know what you know and you will know what you don't know. It's equally important. In the context of an exam, it's good to know what you know and you know it correctly. It's very useful to know what you don't know. You want to know what you don't know before the exam rather than during the exam. Don't you agree? So when you are looking at questions, and I have some more information that I can send that slow down when you're reading questions, you get enough time. And let's pretend you've got 30 multiple choice questions. On an average, you have received two minutes for them. If you're stuck on a question and you are not able to narrow things down by one and a half minutes, it's likely you don't know it. So it's time to not get stuck on one and lose five minutes in that process. It's time to cut your damages and move on to the next question. One of the common things that I see is that in multiple choice exams, students, when they're getting erroneous responses, they usually happen in the last 10 minutes of the exam. The reason is that we are trying to finish in the last 10 minutes of the exam what we should have given 20 minutes. So we make negligent mistakes. So keep your exam moving along in a way that you have equal time for all sections. If you're not able to, think, close your eyes for a minute and think what you remember. Three things that look familiar in that multiple choice exam or three things that you remember. And the correct one is likely to sit in the bubble that you have created by three things that you know. The length and extent of concentration. Just the day before the exam, you can put in five, six hours on a good day and a good week. You want to study things in blocks, so one and a half hour or two hours. And that gives you time to look at the content, to categorize it, to map it out, talk it out, draw it, or even practice. You can give each subject about four study sessions per week of an hour and a half. There will be days you may have to increase them and there will be days when, because you are increasing in some subject, you may have to decrease in some other subject. And that is great. However, don't not look at a subject at all for two weeks and say, tomorrow I'm going to do calc, advanced calc for 20 hours. That day usually does not come. So if you don't have enough time, do it for one hour per week, two hours per week, only on sporadic occasions. However, don't not do it. Talk to yourself. You must have heard this caveat, the mirror doesn't lie. The mirror really does not lie. So if you can, Go to the bathroom, close the door, and talk to the mirror. When you start looking away from the mirror, it's telling you that you don't know it as well as you don't know it. Why? Because we are our harshest critic. 
And because we like to do things well, we cannot even handle the mirror judging us. We want to say things clearly, correctly, accurately. And therefore, when you study something and you spend five minutes or 10 minutes in the bathroom or in front of a mirror, could be on your cell phone um, and talk to it, you will know what you know and what you don't know. Call someone who cares about you and tell them, hey, can I tell you what I just studied in glycolysis and Krebs cycle? Uh, I want to explain the difference to you between oxidation and phosphorylation. Could you listen to me? Now, sometimes you can find a person who can listen to you and sometimes you cannot. That's okay. Just record yourself saying things. Again, it's a easy way to improve your memory power, but more than your memory power, your clear retention of the material. So you can answer the why kind of question. This is one of my favorite tools. I use, I'm a very frugal person by nature. I usually start with the free ones. So Evernote or OneNote, which you all have access to because you have Outlook. So you can use OneNote, you can use Evernote. It works on cross devices from Android to Mac to Windows. And I think you might find that it's easy to build graphs into OneNote or Evernote. And let's say you build a graph today and then you look at it for five minutes twice within 72 hours of creating the graph you, boy, you will know so much more. Simple Mind. Simple Mind is now, I think, giving less for free, but do take it up. And this is my favorite app. It's called Coggle Concept Mapping. Used to be such an expensive thing. Um, and now we can access it free. And this was something, one of the physics um, major students created. The whole chapter of lasers is in one map. And it's very good, Coggle, in the sense there are only four toolbars, one to color, one for the thickness, one to insert images. You can keep it on your phone or any device or save it as a JPEG. And you really begin to understand how one thing is linked to another thing. What are the key formula? What are the key vocabulary? Again, knowing this helps you answer questions with greater accuracy. Now keep in mind that one strategy does not work. So you are not your friend Jane and Jane is not your friend you, or Joey is not you you. So everyone has to decide what works for them. So don't, many times students will ask me, so what do students say is their best strategy? What is the best strategy for one person may not be the best strategy for you. That's why I offer you multiple ways of doing things. You have to experiment with them and then say, which one is working for me? Which one is more to my learning style? On that note, the learning style, many of us think we are visual learners. That's not always true. Most of us are learners in at least two ways. So we mix visual learning and auditory learning, auditory learning and text learning. So I would also encourage you to move away from the notion if you think you are a purely visual learner. 80, 90% of people are not just purely visual learners. 
These are posters we created last year and they've gone around the campus, the Penn campus, and they're very popular. How to develop a deeper understanding, study in groups, review, recall, rephrase. Another one that we was cre creating was learning tools. Um, as I, I told you, I love Kaggle. Um, I'm a big fan of it. It belongs to Google. Uh, there are some, most aspects of it are free. Some are paid, but I always use the free ones. Again, there's a difference. If you like to do things by hand, hey, why not? do them by hand, but don't go with the notion that doing by hand, because creating a graph like this can take two, three hours, and you can create it in an hour on a digital tool. So don't rely on just one thing. I'm looking at the time, I think we have, we're good on time. Do create charts. Examine big ideas twice within 48 hours. If you are short on time, you can extend it to 72 hours. But after 72 hours, your self-retrieval of information starts going down. So you want to look at something, look at it again within 48 to 72 hours. You, your takeaway will be much stronger. And the night before the exam, sleep, please sleep. Don't pull all nighters before an exam. That's where we make the errors, where we have multiple choice questions, especially, and we pick the wrong one because we are working on sleep deprivation. So if you have an exam, sleep is your biggest tool. I can take questions now. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Kumar, for such a wonderful presentation on a topic that is very important for us as pre-meds because we have to ensure that our STEM classes um, are going well. Yes. For GPA. And you also have to take the MCAT. Most of you have to take the MCAT or the DAT. Yeah, that's true. So it's good to not only just retain the knowledge for the exam, but for the MCAT and long term. Yeah. Um, let's start with our first question. Yeah. We have a lot actually. Um, so I guess the first one, um, how do you find, uh, how do you suggest finding our best learning styles? Okay. Well, you have to, for example, right now is a good time when classes are starting and you're trying to experiment what is your learning style. One week, do one thing. Another week, do another way. And by the third week, you will know what you were more successful with and what you were more comfortable with. And so you have to go through this experimental mode in order to know what will work for me Maybe you can talk to a person like me. You can talk to a friend, a TA. TAs are very good for that because they have been students themselves and they know how to ask you questions that will help you identify what is useful for you. Professors are excellent, but TAs, because they are students themselves, they have that personal connection that is more immediate. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Kumar. Our next question is from a Penn student and they are wondering what your advice is on taking challenging classes online. So they're describing their story that they took Orgo last spring and they, it was going well until the pandemic hit and we had to move everything online. So what is your advice um, for her or him uh, on taking or go to or just challenging classes during online um, classes? That's a very good question. And it's a very um, pertinent question for the time that we are struggling with. 
you have to look into your own self. If you are a Penn student, you can always email me and we can talk more about it. But however, if you have challenging classes and you're taking them online, you have to change how you study. You cannot depend on how you studied before the pandemic hit the campus and hope that the same strategy study strategies and time allocation will continue working in this online format. The online format is bringing new challenges and new advantages. And we have to adapt in order to know, can I take on the electives that I could push to next semester when we might be on the campus? Or should I finish my requisite requirements? Or do I, can I take a challenging class that I did not have a great time in the spring semester, but now I know how to study in an online format. All right. And it, this is kind of similar, so you might have answered some parts of it, but do you have specific advice for students who are working remotely and who don't have ideal study environments due to libraries being closed and being at home with a lot of family members and things like that? Yeah, no, it, that's, that's a very critical point. So identify when in the day you have more access to a private study place. Is it late in the evening? Is it after dinner time? Is it in the morning before everyone wakes up? You have to look at the timetables and the patterns of movement of your family members in order to know what's a good time for you to have some private space. Do you have a porch you can sit on? I've seen students even in my neighborhood sitting in their cars and studying because that gives them a private space. And so we have to be inventive and we have to be adaptive. We will come out of these situations that have been in a way levied on us. But for the time being, you want to look at what is the time allocation because you cannot tell people in your homes to not move around, to just give you space, even though they want to, they cannot. I also know a student who sits in the bathtub on a big blanket and studies there. <laughs> so I think it's really testing our adaptability. I think find a porch, a car, um, can you go to a park and break it down in your day? On Wednesday, I'm going to go to the local park and sit there and study. On Tuesday, I'm going to sit on the porch. Monday, I'm going to ask my family if they will give me some quiet time. So you won't be able to expect everything every day, but you will be able to work on what works today this week for me in order to stay focused. Great, great advice, especially right now during the pandemic. Um, I yes. think we have quest, uh, time for like two more questions. Sure. One that's very popular. Um, if we want to do spaced repetition re uh, slash retrieval practice for each of our classes, how do you suggest we make our schedule and keep track of it? Oh, great, great question. So. Uh, if you are taking four classes, allocate that you're going to spend at least five hours per week for each class. Now break it down. One hour of those five hours is to look at what you studied the previous three days. So all those five hours are not for doing practice problems or for doing homework. One is to keep connecting the back information with the front information so that you have a storyline threading your day. Great, thank you so much. And since you had a lot of questions, I'm gonna um, just pick one last one. Um, okay. 
So this one, it's interesting. Um, do you have any strategies you can recommend for students that want to collaborate with other students um, remotely? So just like study sessions and things like that with friends? Okay, so I'm uh, advising many students to do that, um, to actually schedule virtual appointments. So for example, we could say, Ali and Alexia are going to make an appointment to talk about Orgo Chem on Wednesday from two to three. It makes things interesting. It livens up your own uh, routines, but it also puts on some accountability because you're going to go and talk to Alexia with some preparation. So there's accountability bil built into it. There is a shared goal and there is a commitment to succeed in that together. All right, great. I think we're gonna end this session now. Dr. Kumar, thank you so much for being here. It is truly really an honor um, to have you as my mentor and that you were able to participate in this event. So thank you so much. And I think our students really appreciated your techniques and study tips. Wonderful. And I, I, I'm always open to questions. So if you do have more questions, you can email them to me, Ali or Alexia, and I can write down the answers. Okay. Well, it's good seeing you both. Thank you. Take care, Dr. Kumar. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. We are going to transition into our next session. In about four minutes, we will start our next session called Medicine, Science, Public Service and Education and Ever-Evolving Career with Dr. Compton. So just hold tight for four minutes, get up, go get a drink, grab a snack, we'll be back very soon.